Looks like we just had a few more people, which is great. Um, so I guess we can get started. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. Very excited to be here today with Adam Clark. Uh, we're going to be talking about Hyperledger BASU use cases uh, in this session. It's 30 minutes. Um, please feel free to drop, drop questions in the Q&A. We're definitely going to leave time at the end to answer them. Uh, and also we'll try to answer them throughout. Um, and we'll get started, I guess, with intros. Adam, why don't you go ahead and uh, start us? Hey, Grace. So uh, my name is Adam Clark. I'm the CTO at a company called uh, Finality International. Um, and uh, we'll give you a bit of an introduction to what Finality is uh, shortly. But um, I've been uh, been around in tech for about 20 years. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling a bit old today, if I'm honest. Um, but uh, I've been yeah, working with um, open source software probably for about 15 years um, and Hyperledger Bessu now for a couple of years uh, since we started the, uh, the Finality concept a few years back. Great. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, so I'm Grace Hartley. I'm a senior business manager for Consensus. I work on the protocols team there, which uh, is the team that are, uh, develops on and originally submitted Hyperledger Basin. Um, I also sit on the technical steering committee for, for Hyperledger. Um, and I've been at Consensus now whew, three years, uh, but I come from a consulting background. So um, relatively, I guess, new to tech. But Excited to be here. And um, I guess maybe I'll spend 30 seconds giving the Hyperledger Basu overview, <laughs> and then we'll start asking questions for anyone in the audience who is new or hasn't heard of it or is just new to Hyperledger and trying to get a sense of all the projects. So uh, within Hyperledger, there are um, different types of projects. Uh, Hyperledger Basu is under the DLT category, so distributed ledger technology. Uh, specifically, um, Hyperledger Basu is an Ethereum client. So, which is Apache 2 licensed and written in Java. So the way that it's built, it has um, uh, you know, private and permissioning features. If you wanna have a private use case, uh, private chain use case, uh, similar to maybe if you guys are familiar with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, and then also what's highly unique and of all the other Hyperledger projects is that Hyperledger Base is the only project that runs uh, on a public chain on public mainnet Ethereum. Um, but that's the little spiel, so everyone kind of has a sense of where, where they are today. But Adam, why don't you tell me about your use case uh, for Hyperledger Basu and, and more about Finality? Yeah, thank you. I guess um, probably the best thing to do is to start with um, what Finality is, because I'm not sure how many people will be um, familiar with it. So <laughs> yeah. um, Finality's been, uh, Finality's been um, kicking around for about four and a half years now as a, as a project um, and became a company uh, just over two years ago um, in May 2019. Um, it started off basically as a, um, a, a small consortium of banks, uh, sort of um, big global um, systemic banks, looking at um, the post-trade kind of settlement process um, and, and looking at the risk associated with, um, with the movement of money um, after the trade uh, um, settled, effectively, or to settle the money after the trade. Um, and there's a lot of big inefficiencies and problems with that that sort of grown over many, many years. Um, you know, SWIFT tried to solve some of them, CLS Bank tried to solve some of them. Um, but fundamentally, there's still quite a lot of um, risk associated with um, making payments um, in wholesale banking um, or money payments in wholesale banking. So um, these are things like um, kind of settlement risk, um, counterparty risk. Uh, there's all sorts of problems out there. Um, and the, the guys got together and said, look, can we as Finality, or um, it was called um, Utility Settlement Coin at the time, um, can we can we do something where we effectively use a DLT to to, to try and reduce or um, or fix some of these big issues and, um, and problems that we've got with um, with wholesale payments. Um, it went for a little while. It kicked off um, with a small consortium set of um, banks actually growing up to 15 um, global banks that are um, our shareholders today in Finality, including um, uh, companies like Lloyd's, Barclays, Santander, um, Bank of New York Mellon, um, the list goes on. So the small companies, 15. that's what you're saying. No. <laughs> some, some small banks. Yeah. Um, they're our shareholders, they own us. Um, and so we, we've we been um, taking direction effectively. Um, and we, we, we came up with a solution effectively. That's why they, they funded us a couple of years back. Um, and we've been working, and we're still pre, um, we're sort of still pre-revenue generation. We're still working on building our, our products. Um, and we, we really genuinely believe that we've got a way to, to solve a bunch of these um, these wholesale banking problems. Um, and, and we're doing so with um, Ethereum um, and, and initially um, Hyperledger Basic. Um, so the problems that we're we're kind of solving effectively um, are it takes two to three days to actually settle cash um, if you're moving wholesale money. 
Um, there's a lot of messages that go backwards and forwards, and that generates risk, right? What happens if the company that I've sent money to goes bust before they legally own it, et cetera? You know, I've got to stand in the uh, the the the, um, the kind of list of um, of creditors and try and get my money back. Um, and the other way around as well, counterparty risk is a big thing where I have to I have to use another bank or a, an organization has to use another bank to make payments on their behalf in a different currency, et cetera. Um, that money sits on the the counterparty's balance sheet. Same problem. If they go bust, I'm just in the list of um, of um, creditors trying to get my money back. Um, so what we're trying to do is to to solve those problems by by actually generating a truly decentralized um, uh, payment system. So we're not a coin um, in any in any way, shape, or form. Um, we're just a payment system, just um, a payment system. Um, and, and what that allows us to do. Um, using a DLT is effectively get rid of a lot of those um, decent, um, decentralized problems um, and, and, and create a true peer-to-peer -peer, um, network. Um, and what I mean by um, decentralization here, because I mean, you'll hear me say decentralization quite a lot, but um, what I mean by decentralization here is um, there's no um, single um, entity running the DLT. Um, the nodes are run by the banks and the participants themselves. Um, so um, while there's an oversight and a regulatory um, side of things um, for the finality organizations to, uh, to deal with, um, effectively um, what we're doing is um, to decentralize everything. So all the nodes sit out within the, the, the banks themselves. So it's truly peer-to-peer. -peer. They're running it. The consensus algorithm is running um, in the banks um, and then they're peer-to-peer. -peer. So um, how this works pretty, is... Um, and that's fairly typical requirement just for regular regulatory purposes like and particularly like all a lot of financial institutions want to run on premise and that's kind of one of their major requirements i think sometimes that they think and correct me if i'm wrong that that's not an option but it really is you know uh, yeah, what you all are so. doing and, and sometimes i think they that kind of gets misconstrued in, in requirements building yeah I agree, and it's so important to our use case yeah. because if um, if finality has um, if effectively can um, control or manage the network, we're not truly decentralized. You're, you've got a yeah. single point of centralization, right? So you're kind of um, kind of almost missing the point of a DLT. Um, you've got a notary in in, in finality. Um, so we're trying not to do that effectively. Um, so the, the banks run the the nodes. Mm -hmm. um, and how it works is we, we, we've been um, we've just had a, a sort of a major milestone within finality um, and that is that um, the the Bank of England recently published a new policy um, allowing um, or widening out access to uh, central bank accounts um, and uh, we've put our application in to get the, um, the our, our first central bank account which um, we're working with the Bank of England on now um, and that's a major major milestone for us so that means that um, we can hold um, a central bank account, um, and when when people when organisations or um, participants of our network fund the, um, the the finality bank account, we will effectively tokenize that money um, and, and and give access and give full ownership of that money back to them immediately, um, and that that effectively removes the counterparty risk. They don't have to move money through a counterparty, but also they can then use the DLT to move money between participants instantly. With legal settlement finality and not have to worry about a two two or three day settlement period so that's our that's our killer use case effectively yeah um and then when we've got one network in the bank of england we're we're looking to move to the ecb the fed we're looking to build out multiple currencies to kind of create like a, a global um what we call it the finality global payment system and un, un, you know not unreasonably um to, to allow cross-border payments um effectively um instantly and with with legal settlement finality very cool. No, that's so exciting. Thanks for that overview. I uh, obviously know you guys work, but I didn't even appreciate kind of the inner workings and how I knew it was a very big deal that Bank of England came out with their new requirements for you all. And that really opens up the use case. And I think it's interesting. I think a lot of other central banks will be following their lead if they haven't already. And I think by them kind of giving the stamp of approval, uh, I, I, I'm optimistic, which take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that others will be falling in, in their footsteps. Um, we, we're certainly optimistic as well. Yes, <laughs> for <obvious reasons. laughs> yes, for sure. Um, no, that's awesome. And I, uh, yeah, I, uh, that's really cool to hear kind of the evolution of the process too, and kind of, you know, finding that right fit and, and getting those big players on board too is, is uh, you know, humongous. So congratulations to you all, first of all. Um, Thank you. But I'd love to, so I'd love to hear, so, we talked about the use case. I think a lot of people then, once you identify the use case, 
a common next step is what DLT should you use? And there are, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I like to say not all blockchains are created equal, you know, and you think, you know, and if you're new to the space or you're new to Hyperledger, even there's, you know, many different options and many different ways you could go about it. I'd love to hear kind of your process for choosing the right DLT. And then maybe talk about how you ended up at Besu and what was important for your use case requirements that, that it yeah. met or didn't, or just love to hear that kind of evolution. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can I can sort you through that. So, so um, there's a number of things were key for us. The first one was that we needed a private um, permissioned network, effectively. So um, we we needed to look at something that, or we, we decided to look at something that was um, enterprise Ethereum alliance spec mm -hmm. compliant. Um, and we're a big member and and um, and uh, influencer in the EA world. We you know we're we're, we're very keen on the organisation. Um, and of course, Basu being one of the um, the clients that's um, that is uh, compatible with the the core spec there at the EA. So that was the, one of the first things, private permissioned uh, blockchain network or DLT, um, so that we can effectively manage the the access to the network. It has to be closed. It has to be permissioned. It's not going to. We're never going to run this on mainnet um, for obvious reasons because we're back. We're, we're we're backing central central bank money. Yep. Um, and there's two other things that are really important to us or were really important to us. The first one um, is getting to settlement finality. So. Um, there are a set of regulations, um, set of settlement finality regulations that, that we had to meet um, in order to be able to back um, central bank money. Um, and actually the consensus um, algorithm within Besu um, being the IBFT2 or IBFT kind of algorithm um, allows us to actually get to a, the point where we can we can show that we have a, um, legal, settle, legal settlement finality at a, at a given point within the, the consensus mm -hmm. algorithm. So really important for, for central banks and for, for meeting regulation. So that was another, that was a key. Yeah. And it's also interesting, or I like to call out, you know, there are different consensus mechanisms for different uh, use cases. So for IBFT2, it's kind of known to be like that, um, uh, it's stable and that uh, instant um, finality. And that is like what it's, you know, benefit is, right? So that fits a settlement, um, uh, settlement use case, for example, that you all are talking about. Um, and then there are other ones like that are much more performance driven and can fit other use cases, but that like, I like to just call out that they're, you know, this one fits, but there are different kind of options that you could choose if, if your use case was different. Um, but that yeah, one definitely met your needs, which is, which is, which is great. That's why the team built it. You know? exactly, <laughs> so no, I, that's so music to my ears, really. <laughs> I mean, so, so performance isn't um, a, a massive deal for us because we're, we're talking about wholesale banking here. So, um, you know the, the 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 transactions per second. That numbers are going to be relatively low, even if um, if um, finality reaches quite a lot of um, the market. So um, so actually, what we what we care about much more in terms of um, consensus is um, that it is truly peer to peer, that it is decentralized, um, and that it's very secure. I.e., it's very diff um, difficult to um, destabilize the network. Uh, obviously, um, and and obviously um, operate from a resilience perspective. If you've got um, you know twenty um, Bank, banks, 21 banks or whatever, running um, the, the the validator nodes on the network, um, you know, actually penetrating or trying to um, uh, create problems within, you know, a third of those to stop the network or two thirds of those to um, to compromise the network is is you know going to be um, significantly uh, more difficult than than hacking or, or or attacking a centralized system. Right? So. I know. Well, yeah, I I think this is actually some. So I'll, I'll keep chiming in. I apologize. So it's interesting because we. Um, I get that question a lot also when people are considering using Base2 and what makes sense. And they're asking about, um, or, or they ask about like the security of it. And you're like, well, like mainnet Ethereum and, and Hyperledger Base2 runs on mainnet Ethereum has never been, you know, uh, has have never crashed, you know? <laughs> so you can at least live with, that's probably the best use case of kind of the, the strength of the network, but also then uh, security audits. I think not everyone knows that code bases like blockchain DLTs do uh, security audits. And uh, we obviously do testing kind of these uh, use cases and, and particularly the private and permissioning features because they're not tested every day on mainnet. Uh, and, and we've done a couple of those in the last couple of years. So it's, you know, those kind of security requirements that you're thinking of and, and testing those network is is something uh, that at least we really think about a lot and making sure it's, it's fit for you know, production, not just messing around in a POC, because that's <laughs> Good. very important uh, to that, us. That, that, that makes me feel very happy. Good. I'm glad I'll, you said I'll that. send you the reports <laughs> of the security audits if you'd like. <laughs> so, 
Um, I guess, and then the final thing that we really, really care about is disintermediation. Um, and that's, um, that's a, that sounds like a big word, but ba basically what I mean by that is um, effectively, um, because we want this to be a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's, um, it's participants running the network, uh, moving money between each other, um, and the DLT being the, 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 the true um, immutable kind of um, ledger of those, those transactions. Um, what we want to make sure is that all nodes are equal. So there is no, um, so we are completely um, effectively um, disintermediated. Um, if we had a single notary, like I said earlier, in finality or in a node or anything like that, then we're introducing single points of failure, but we're also introducing the, the, po the possibility of, um, of the, the network being um, compromised. So one of the key things with um, BESU and the, and the, um, uh, and the algorithm that, that we've got with, um, in IBFT um, is that all nodes are completely equal. So um, that's a, a really, really important part to us. So decentralization, in, disintermediation, just move everything out there. And it's, um, all of that stuff is really interesting because um, we, we, you know, we, we've tried to build everything in that decentralized way so that we're not just using a DLT as, um, as a ledger because you know, it's, it's a database and that's great. It's actually getting it so that we're truly and utterly decentralized um, and, and that no one can really compromise the network. Yeah, and that seems, I, I think, even a couple of years ago, uh, I think you're right, it was just being used kind of as a registry, a lot of DLT use cases, particularly with enterprises. And and I think you all are leaders in the space of kind of thinking beyond that. But I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that and, and kind of uh, and taking the real benefits of the blockchain, not just, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's here's a hash on it a ledger that can say a transaction happened, but really what's the, <laughs> you know, yeah, what's the value of it, which is decentralization and, and having that ownership and, and that collaboration across competitors. You can't talk, you know, having all of those banks that you listed at the beginning, you know, working together is uh, not always an easy feat. And, 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 and then having that trust in, in the technology as well as the use case itself. Yeah, trust. Trust is a key word here. We're building trust in not just the technology, but also the, the the participants between themselves as well. Where where the banks didn't necessarily trust each other that much before. So it is a it's yeah. a very different way of thinking. Uh, right? Yes, yeah, so totally. Like <laughs> flipping business on its head. That's <laughs> um, it's crazy, but but very 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 cool. Um, I'd love to hear. Right, oh, go ahead. There's just one one final thing which I think is one of the killer um, uh, reasons for picking. Um, for Bikin Basu, so I just yeah, the one that I, I really love is the fact that um, we, we partner with a company called Adara, which um, is a um, is a consensus company as well, um, and they've actually um, got um, precedent with using um, Besu with the banks with central banks. Um, they've they run a, um, a project a few years ago um, called Coca, um, which is um, well, Coca, which was with the um, the um, South African National Bank, um, the Saab, and of course that that sort of set a precedent really. So. Um, the, the central banks know of BESU and know what it is. So it's a, it's a really good client for us to, to start with. Yeah, it, it definitely, so that is actually a good point, I should say. So there's COCA with the South African Reserve Bank. There's um, the Bank of Thailand that also is a, their central bank that's used as BESU. And there are um, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority as a part of that. And then there are a few others that I can't remember if they're public or not. <laughs> so, I'm, but but it's actually very commonly used. So it's I think sometimes people think with Besu they're like it's, but um, or I, I wonder. I'd love to kind of challenge other people. But sometimes the feedback we get is uh, it's not. Um, do I only use it for public chain or do I only use it for those use cases? And actually, not at all. And even the CBDC use case is pretty. Um, it's. Uh, at least five or six central banks are using it right now, which is very, very cool. And and uh, and Atara is fantastic at, um, and very um, knowledgeable at the, about the space too. Um, great, no, but I'd love to hear, so I know we only have 10 minutes left, which is kind of crazy, but I'll ask a couple more questions and then I'll leave sure. more questions at the end. Reminder for everyone, please feel free to drop some questions in the Q&A. Happy to answer them in just a minute. Um, but yeah, what, if there are any lessons learned in your selection process for your DLT of choice, anything like if someone was kind of at the beginning of their process, what would you say to them when they were choosing the DLT of their choice? Would it be run more POCs, go like think what, yeah, what are those, what's that kind of lessons learned? Yeah. I think for me, it's, um, it's really understand your, your use case, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, for us, um, you know, the IBFT consensus algorithm works disintermediate disintermediation is important. Um, so all of those those reasons mean and legal settlement finality. We had 
a good list of things that we needed to make sure we we, we could um, meet beforehand. So it was actually a relatively easy process for us. Um, you know, run POCs absolutely. I mean, actually, down, um, you know, how do you how do you get started with Bessie? Just download it and play with it. It's actually surprisingly easy to do. Um, even <laughs> I could do it, which um, my my team were quite surprised about. I think so. Um, it's it's really it's you know, just get on with it. But um, POCs are really good. Um, we I mean we you know we it was an easy it was an easy choice for us with um with the um president from um Adara and the the other CDBC project as you say. Um, but I think really know your requirements. Um, really understand what the the key things you're looking for are, um, and actually it'll be a pretty easy process to pick the right DLT from there. Yeah, I think that's actually that's great feedback because I always think, and sometimes you know, I'm, I'm sure some people have half their requirements and know half of a DLT, and they're trying to make it fit. And it's like, no, like it, you're right. That's like if you have those requirements and are really, uh, really locked down that. <laughs> That does make it really easy, and and I don't see it always uh, in the at least some of the organizations I talk to. It's not always like that, so that's great feedback for everyone as they're kind of getting started. And then to your point, uh, so we're at the Hyperledger Global Forum. This is Hyperledger Projects. Everything's open source. Here's my shameless plug: <laughs> that uh, please go ahead and get started on Basu. And it is um, you can um, uh, we actually have a brand new. Um, Basu Essentials training course on Linux Foundation's training site. So if you're deciding or thinking about what your DLT of choice is or want to get more familiar with it, uh, there's a whole training course video where you get walk step by step of setting up a private network on it. And that will um, highly recommend those of you interested to give that a shot because that's really, um, uh, you know, very easy. As you said, I could do it. So, <laughs> you know, uh, definitely um, an easy way to go, go there. Um, or do we have any questions in the Q&A or chat? Looks like we have. If not, I can keep talking, but. Nothing is them... yet. All right. Um, then I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, the uh, privacy that you guys use. So you have, uh, I imagine you use a private transaction manager to run privacy groups or is that correct like let me know what how do you guys yeah. uh, set that up on your network it's a, it, i mean this is a really interesting um point and actually one of um a, a lot of debate in the in the recent years with finality actually um from a from a dlt perspective and the actual ledger itself we don't um, apply any kind of obfuscation at all um it's cool. it's just a just a payment system as i said at the beginning um and the point <laughs> of um we don't want to we don't want to apply obfuscation it, it makes um it makes audit from regulators harder it makes all sorts of things harder and actually because we're not because we're we're, we're a payment system and we're just recording payments um there's no third party data so we don't get involved in aml or, or kyc or any of those things and actually the data on the um on the, the network um, we then protect using um, a, a commercial agreement uh, or a legal agreement with the participants. Um, we, so we don't want to implement any particular um, level of privacy there um, mm -hmm. on the network. But um, it, from a private transactions perspective, we absolutely do want to make um, available to the the, um, the participant banks some sort of um, uh, private transaction or private messaging um, feature um, so that they can do deals um, on the side of the chain without recording it straight to the DLT. Um, and allow them to to um, you know agree you know FX swaps and all sorts of things can be done there so that they're talking to each other peer to peer and there's no again it's all decentralized um, so that's the probably the next biggest thing for us on our list from uh, a basic perspective and indeed from the EEA as well um, EEA is looking quite a lot at the um, of the uh, the private transaction stuff at the moment so um, that's a that's a key next step for us I, I think we we, we, we want to work on our use cases for, for private transactions and help drive that um, into the EA and, and then with you guys at um, BESU as well. Yeah, no, no, that's good. To, uh, that's a great clarification too, because I, I think sometimes um, uh, everyone thinks you need all privacy everywhere, <laughs> you know, in a private network. And really that's not necessarily the, the biggest value add. And I, uh, I think that's really interesting. One, um, uh, one point to mention to the audience, if you guys are, I think I said privacy groups, assuming everyone would know what that is. If you're familiar with, um, <laughs> if you're familiar with um, private channels on Fabric, for example, it's the same concept uh, essentially of kind of on a permission network, you can assign uh, a, a number of nodes that you want within a privacy group. And instead of having, um, and within that private network, that group can um, agree, as Adam said, on FX, 
FX credits, for example, or whatever it is, and um, then it will hash on the on the um, broader chain, but they won't know what the agreement was or what um, or, or what the information was that was agreed upon. So you kind of get that that security and privacy. Uh, it looks like. Uh, Arun, uh, looks like we have our first question, which is great. Uh, we have about four minutes left, just saying that out loud to keep me on track because I can talk all day. Um, what are your thoughts on throughput and Basu? Um, would, do you want to take that in or want me to take it first? <laughs> I will, um, I'll, I'll give you um, my perspective really quickly and then, yeah. then you can take it. Well. I mean, so, so for us, actually, um, throughput isn't a major issue because wholesale banking volumes are not that high. Mm -hmm. um, and because we're not going to have one big global network, we're going to have many closed private permission networks that interoperate one for each currency around the world. Actually, you know, the, the, the transactions stay very low. So, um, Grace, as you were saying earlier, effectively, um, the IBFT, um, the kind of proof of authority algorithms, they're not necessarily particularly um, in high throughput. Um, but if high throughput is what you need, then absolutely there are other, other algorithms, consensus algorithms that, that will push, I think, Bessie pretty hard. Yeah. Um, but then over to you to say what pretty hard is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I can put my finger in the air. No, so I think um, it's worth saying public chain, obviously, for the proof of work um, consensus mechanism when uh, Base is running on Ethereum mainnet, it has the same exact throughput as any other Ethereum client. It's like, what, 12 to 14, I think, ish uh, TPS on the Ethereum mainnet. But then within privacy, um, we have uh, an article actually on the performance on Hyperledger uh, from last year, um, but we can get to probably a few hundred TPS, um, but uh, but there's so many different ways to optimize it. And I'm sure people at the conference are already talking about layer two scalability um, and all the ways you can uh, use rollups or other scaling options to really optimize for that. So um, uh, it's, it's it, I really, I don't think it's the drawback that it might've been uh, a couple of years ago, for example. I think there's just so many ways to optimize for a use case. Um, but that's a great question, Arun. Um, the, and then we got a question around comparing Besu versus Gokorum. Adam, I don't know if you want to take that or <laughs> you could start again and I'll, I'll finish. Pretty quick one on that for, for me. I think um, the key, key there is that they are converging. Um, they are converging term clients uh, uh, on the um, EEA core spec, um, which is great. And hopefully we'll see networks where um, Quorum and uh, and Mbessu can interoperate um, on the same network at some time in the future. I mean, they're, they're based on, um, you know, um, effectively different technologies and they're based on very different um, licensing um, uh, rules as well. So um, the key thing is to look at the licensing, um, I, I would say. Um, yeah, again, over especially, to you. yeah, no, that's a great point. So um, maybe just kind of the quick facts. I think you're totally right, Adam. So, um, um, Currently, uh, my team actually works both on Gokorum and Besu, um, and a big focus for both of them is interoperability, as he said, and thinking about hybrid networks and, and how we're working on those together. Um, but there are different, uh, some different features. So for example, um, uh, Besu is written in Java and Apache 2 licensed, and then, uh, which is more of a permissive licensing, Gokorum is written in Go and um, LGPLs license, which is a little different as well. So those are kind of the two different ones, but as you're right, a lot of the features and even uh, today, so uh, the different private transaction managers you can use are um, uh, are compatible with both. Um, there is um, a, a BFT, I think like it's called QBFT, uh, that is a consensus mechanism that we're working on that work with both of them. So it is a very, uh, a lot of the features are very inter interoperable and, and um, uh, try and, but uh, and then I guess the one big difference that I am a little embarrassed I forgot of course is that Gokorum doesn't run on mainnet uh, Basu runs on mainnet and and that's if you're thinking of a mainnet use case uh, Basu would be the only choice of the two uh, and then yeah so Mohan you just asked this question and then um, we'll, if there's one more question we'll we'll take it but then we'll wrap up here um, uh, so can Basu work in private and public uh, mode simultaneously so no, <laughs> or it depends what you're trying to do. Um, there are ways, like in, the team has been thinking about how you connect private privacy groups with public chain Ethereum. Um, it doesn't, it's still in development is what I'd say. So there's something we think about at this point, but it's not, um, at this point, I wouldn't say it's ready for production. 
but there's definitely ways to kind of configure your network if, if that's a big requirement, but that's a good question. Any other questions? We'll give them just five seconds. Cool, okay. Um, well, with that, Adam, I wanna thank you very much for your time. Uh, where could, you know, if your audience is curious to reach out to you, where could they find you? Would love to hear kind of, you know, if they wanna hear more about your use case or your experiences or uh, what's a good spot to find you. Yeah, no, and thank you very much for the, the invite. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been fun to, to chat, so thank you for that. Um, if you're yeah, interested in, in more about Finality or, or the better use case for us, um, probably a good starting point is our, our website, finality.org. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, um, white papers and um, views are, are, um, from us on there, quite a lot on um, the use case, but also around the use of DLT and, and, and why we think um, decentralization is the right way to go. Um, otherwise, find me on LinkedIn. Um, my link my LinkedIn profile is, I believe, on my profile for the for the forum. So feel feel free to reach out. Great, uh, and uh, everyone can do the same for me, as he said. Uh, but you can find me on. Um, I'll put my email just in the chat, just in case. But as you said in the forum, we're all here and we'll be around the next couple of days. We really appreciate you all turn, tuning in and joining us and and uh, hearing a little bit about <laughs> Basu and, and CBDCs and Finality. And, and I think it was a great session. So Adam, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Joyce. Thanks very much. Have a good one.